Stay standing with me. We're going to dive into the Word of God. We started a new series last week. It's a pretty brave series, I think. It's called You, Me, and the Color of My Skin. And uh, who's ready for part two this week? Great. Um, we uh, established for ourselves a bit of a theme of verse out of Psalm 139 last week. And I want to start there again this week. Um, and I want us to pray this together out loud and with some confidence. Read it real quick while I'm talking, if you didn't, don't remember it from last week. But this is the scariest yet most effective prayer you can pray before God. When you start asking God to do this, man, he'll show up. Start asking God to point to things in your heart that need to change. And that's really what this series is about, y'all. It's pretty much what every Sunday is about. Every time I preach, we're asking God, would you show us things that need to be altered, need to be shifted? If you want that, say amen. Pray this with me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. This is big. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. As the Holy Spirit works today and he speaks to us, and I'm hoping that he speaks to us all on a very personal level today, please note to yourself that that first when he pokes at something, it's not out of condemnation. He's poking to some place that he wants to step into. And why? So that he can lead us in the life of everlasting. I'm thankful for the life of everlasting. Anyone else thankful for that? I got one more scripture. Let's go to Galatians 3. This is the Paul, the Paul, <laughs> the Apostle Paul. Uh, this is Paul writing to the church at Galatia. And he says this, he says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is amazing. When you, when you give your life over to, to Jesus, God doesn't see you as you necessarily are who you've been, what you've done. He sees you as the righteousness of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that as I come before God today, again, I didn't have to clean myself up. I did. I showered last night, just so you all know. But rather, God sees me as his son. Paul says this, and, and because you're clothed with Christ, this is huge, y'all. There is no, there's no longer, there's neither Jew or Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. Here it is, for you are all, say this word with me. Let me try that again. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. God, go before us, speak to us today. Let's uh, lighten up the mood here just a little bit again. We love community, we love connection, and I know Matt had you high five some people before you, but I want to push our high fiving limits, and I want you to find high. I want you to find five people that I want you to high five, and I just want you to tell them that it's great to see them. I don't know about you, I need some encouragement. I bet the people around you do too. So high five five people around you before you're seated. Tell them it's great to see you. It's great to see you, and then you can be seated only when you've hit that quota. Let's thank our worship team real quick, all of our home teams that make these moments possible. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, wow, wow. Y'all come to practice sometime. Y'all come to practice sometime early on a Sunday morning and see what these peeps have to do to lead us in the moments that we've got. It'll make you appreciate them. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. Thank you for all of our home teams. Um, can we have a little bit of fun today? Is that okay? Now, we in a serious series, and you all know how serious I get. Um, but can we have fun? Say amen if you want to have some fun. All right, I wanna, I, I've kind of proven myself in my first year of, of being a pastor of um, making up some of the dumbest illustrations um, possible. If you were here last week, man, that one, that one might have topped the charts. Um, but today I want to introduce you yet another amazing game that I've created. Um, and in just a second, folks... Uh, I am going to show a series of pictures, and when I show you the pictures, wait on my cue, Keith, thank you so much. When I show you the pictures, I, I want you to say out loud what comes to your mind when you see the picture. And I'm not really asking you to, to say what it is, but rather, what are the thoughts in your mind that come to your mind when you see the, the picture, okay? The name of this game is uh, Say What You Think. And I feel like we'd all be very good at that, don't you? Say what you, 
All right. Uh, so again, not, I don't want random words, okay? I know some of you are just, we're going to say something random, try to be funny. Just say what you think. All right, give me my first picture. Okay, I got ice cream. Any other, what does this make you think? Yum, delicious. Sugar. Fantastic. Give me my second picture. Scary run. Any, anyone else? What? Uh, all right. Third picture. Legend. Super Bowl champion. All right. Um, don't go to the next pictures till I tell you, Keith. We on the same page? All right. Love you, man. Um, I want to I wanna twist things a little bit, and I want to add a variation to the game. I'm going to show you two more pictures, okay? Um, and I, I do not want you to say out loud what you think. Uh, I just want you to think what you think, okay? Just think what you think. Do not say what you think. Church will get really awkward if you say what you think right now, okay? If we're all in agreement, say I. I'm like at a board meeting, okay. Do not, do not say what you think. Just think what you think. You can laugh. You can maybe make a sound effect, but don't say what you think. Cool? Say amen if you're with me. Okay, go ahead, Keith. First picture. Just think what you think. Just think what you think. Uh, okay, go to the next picture. Just think what you think. Just think what you think. Um... I'll tell you what one word probably comes to mind after the second picture was that comes to a lot of our minds is confused. Um, all right, get those off the screen. Okay, what I was illustrating there, what I kind of wanted to point out and have us all experience together was a specific mental process that happened in all of our brains. And it's called categorization. Somebody say categorization. Categorization, my, my left side peeps are awake today. Hopefully the right side will wake up maybe midway through the sermon. Categorization, and categorization occurs when we, we see something with our eyes, one thing with our eyes, but then our mind pulls up, it pulls up a category for, for that. And it's got a whole lot of intel and content and information that your, your mind has gathered throughout your lifetime, okay? And so, you know, when I, when I showed the picture of the bear... Um, you know, some people, you saw it, and then your eyes said, okay, this is what we're looking at based on the overall shape, the teeth, the eyes, the fur. Your mind said, oh, I think that's a bear, and it went, here's the, here's the bear category. And, and some people said scary. Um, other people said run. Uh, one of the things I thought was yogi. Yogi, yogi the bear. Don't take me camping. I will not survive out in the wild. <laughs> Um, and in short, categorization, here, here's the definition. Categorization is the process through which ideas and objects are recognized, differentiated, classified, and understood. Categorization is when we see one thing, and based on that information that we see, our mind pulls up this category, and it's got all this information all this information, we showed you Aaron Rodgers, and some of you saw Aaron Rodgers, and the, the jersey probably was a dead giveaway, so was his faith. And some of y'all had legend in, in your, your category for him. Some of you had Super Bowl champion in your, in your category because you know Jesus and, and you're saved. Um, those are what was in your category. Um, categorization is our mind's way of making sense of the world. And, and, it, and it does so so that we can act as quickly as possible and make decisions as quickly as possible in the shortest amount, amount of time. And it's something that, that we all do. Look at your neighbor and say, you do it. You do it. We all do it. We do it. And, and for the most part, categorization is actually, it's a really helpful thing. It's a very beneficial thing. Because if we, if we weren't able, if our minds didn't categorize, we would exhaust our lives having to relearn and rediscover things over and over and over again if you didn't have a category for things. Like, you walked into this room today, um, even if you were a first-time guest, you walked into this room and, and you didn't stop. No one flagged me down and said, I'm looking uh, for something that I can sit on. You, no, you, you saw a chair and you took 
a seed on it, and yet no one told you what it was. Why? Because you had a category for it. You saw what looked like a chair category. Oh, I'm going to sit on it. And our lives would be very exhausting without, without categorization. It's, it's something that we all do. But it's, it's not just something that, that we do when it comes to um, bears and political endorsing apparel that were photoshopped onto your pastor. Again, photoshopped onto your pastor. That's the power of category. Some of y'all don't know me. That's why that wasn't funny. Because you don't know who I am, but you saw something that brought up a category. That's the point of categories. We don't just do it about that. We don't just do it about ice cream cones and Aaron Rodgers. Um, but come to find out that we also do it with, with people. And we do it socially as well. And there's a really scientific um, fancy word. Let me see if I can look at it so I'm, I, I don't get this wrong. It's called social categorization. Social categorization where... It's a process of classifying people into groups based on certain characteristics such as nationality, age, political preferences, occupation, or the color of one's skin. And again, this is, this sometimes can be beneficial. It can be that we've got classified groups of, of, of people. In one um, book on racial reconciliation I, I read, um, it was talking about how this is a good thing, like if you, were, you were, went to a new city that you'd never been to before and you were lost. Um, and I suppose I'd also have to say, if you lost your, your smartphone, you were lost and you lost your smartphone. What a horrible world we live in. You can't even get lost anymore. Um, <laughs> if you were lost and you didn't have a smartphone, and you didn't know where to go, how to get to where you were trying to go, you could just start going around and talking to anyone. And that could take a lot of time because not everyone may know where you need to go. But what you might do, might do, is you might socially categorize and start looking for specific categories. You, you might look like, I mean, I, I don't know that there's not many of them nowadays, but you might look for a taxi driver or someone with an Uber sign in, the, in their car. You might look for a police officer. You might look for a hotel attendant. Someone that based on your social categories, will know, have a better chance of knowing where you need to go. Jackie and I, we used social categorization um, a few months ago. Um, Jackie uh, was going through the pleasant experience of, uh, of having a kidney stone. And, and she'd fought the pain for like four weeks, four weeks longer than I would have fought the pain. And, and she fought it, she fought it, she fought it until one night she was like, I can't do it anymore, I need to see someone. Now, when she said, I need to see someone, we didn't sit down and put together a list of potential candidates. I didn't look at her and say, okay, uh, we stop at my parents' house, see Steve and Vicky. They may be able to help. Uh, I didn't say, well, the mall has a lot of people. Swing through the mall. Th there are assistants there that may be. No, 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 no. By social categorization, we didn't even think. Boom, doctor. Boom, we got to go to a hospital. Social categorization, it can be a benefit um, to our life until it's not. Social categorization can be helpful in how we live our, our lives un until it's not. Until it starts determining how we treat each other. Someone say amen if you're with me. Until it starts dictating who we choose to connect with and get to know until it starts defining who we love and how we love them. Here's the uncomfortable question that I think that we've got to wrestle with today is, is this. Today I'm wondering how your, your category for another person's skin color impacts the way you love them and the way you treat them. I want to um, point out a book. I believe we've got a slide for it. The book is entitled Disunity in Christ. And if you're looking for further reading on this subject, it's a great book. Um, and in this book, Disunity in Christ, the author, uh, Christina Cleveland, she talks about how one of the first ways that social categorization can very negatively impact our perspective of each other and how we treat each other is that social categorization, um, it, it immediately leads to comparisons. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but let's go a little bit further. Because every time we social, socially categorize, we, we automatically create two different groups, 
two different groups. And in the psychology world, they are known as the in-group and the out-group. Somebody say in-group. Somebody say out-group. Out-group. The, the in-group consists of the group that you are in. Makes sense? It's the, it's the group that, that you belong to. Uh, like, for instance, all, all, all my ladies in the house say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so that would be one of your in-groups. You are in the group known as women. Your out-group would be all my men say, oh, yeah. Wow, I like my men. Y'all were stronger with that one. Typically, the men are the quiet people in church, but y'all are there for me today. That would be, be as, a, as a woman, that might be your, your out-group. There's in-groups and there's out-groups, and there's tons of different groups that you can be in, and you can be in them all at once. But when you're in one group, there's automatically going to be an out-group. We could talk about our in-groups of, of our occupations, like I said, you know, where we stand politically. You want to talk about a really animated grouping, social category in our world today. Just talk about that one. You, you, could, talk, you could even go into like our individual taste in, in movies and music. There's, there's a lot of different um, groupings, but everyone is in one group, their in-group, and there's another group known as their out-group. Now, if you... you don't read psych psychology articles. Um, maybe you've never heard of, of those terms, the in-group and out-group. I'll be honest with you, I hadn't either before I read about them. Um, but you probably know the in-group and the out-group a little bit better by what they're also called. Um, it's the groups known as us and them. Somebody say us. Say then. Us and them. Us and them. You ever had a conversation with someone in your in-group um, talking about us and then talking about them? I had one just this last Sunday. I did. Kind of embarrassed to admit it, but I was talking with a buddy of mine. It was Sunday night about 7, I think it was about 7.42, um, and I, I said to him, I said, I would hate to be them right now. And, of course, you all know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Dallas Cowboy fans. Hello! Okay. Um, but seriously, I've been a part of some not-so-comical, not-so-good-natured us-and-them conversations, have you? You don't have to nod your head. You don't have to blink. You don't have to raise your hand. But I'm the pastor of this church, so I might as well be transparent. If anyone is going to be transparent today. I had those conversations, and, and they were... Uh, maybe your conversations when you're having an us conversation where you're talking about, well, them and how they are. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your conversations are, are different from mine. But mine, the conversations that I've been a part of in my life, they weren't full of comments about, man, how awesome they are. They weren't filled with, with comments about, you know what, their perspective is very valuable. And I think we should connect with them and find out what their perspective is. Because when we make comparisons between our in-group and our out-group, between us and them, the next thing that very naturally forms, this is just very naturally and intrinsically forms, is that there's a byproduct called bias. Bias. I'm not going to ask you to say that one because no one ever wants to think that we're biased. But there's bias. You got bias. Another word for it is prejudice. More innocent term is you got preferences. You got preferences. Because when we got an in-group and we got an out-group, odds are is that you, you prefer your in-group to your out-group. Talking about a lot of different levels, I'm going to zone in at the end. But right now, we're going to be a lot of different categories. You prefer your group's ideas to their ideas. You prefer your group's perspective to, to their perspective. And, and, and at the core, it's not, it's not like audaciously evil. It's largely because you've just got way more information about your in-group than you do about people in your out-group. And, and you've just, you're just more used to people in your in-group than you are with your, your out-group. Miles McPherson, um, he's a pastor and an author uh, of the book um, known as The Third Option. It's a book on racial reconciliation, The Third Option. I'm going to be clear with you because I never want to pretend like I read something that I didn't. I didn't read the book, okay? But I did, I did, don't laugh at me, I did watch the sermon series that he did it, which is basically the con same content as the book. And he put such, together such a great breakdown for how our biases show up in the, in the way that we think. And I'm curious to see if you've experienced these like I know I have. He, here's nine, nine ways that I'm going to go very quickly through of, of, of uh, bias that shows up in our thinking, in-group biases. Number one, I'm more comfortable with people who are like me. 
Um, I'm more inclined to spend time with people who are like me. I'm more patient with people who are like me. I get, this is a big one, I give the benefit of the doubt more quickly to people who are like me. I express grace more quickly to people who are like me. It's easier for me to communicate with people who are like me. I assume that I will get along easier with those who are like me. I am more willing to go out of my way to help those who are like me. I possess more positive assumptions about those who are like me. And then Miles McPherson, he says, on the other hand, for, for every set of biases that we have, um, we, we've got some, some um, points of discrimination that we've got towards the out group. And they're pretty much just the opposite of our biases for our in group. Here they are. Here's nine of them. I'm less comfortable with those who are not like me. Don't, you don't have to nod your head, but I'll, let me answer for you. I, I, I bet that's true of all of us. It's just very natural. I'm less inclined to spend time with those not like me. I'm less patient with those not like me. I give the benefit of the doubt slower to those not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those not like me. It's more difficult to communicate with those not like me. I don't assume I will get along with those not like me. I I'm less willing to go out of my way to help those not like me. I possess less positive assumptions about those not like me. And again, these biases, the these points of discrimination, they happen by default. They just happen. Somebody say it happens. It happens. They happen because our brains, our brains are programmed very naturally to create categories. And when our brain does that, these biases and, and points of discrimination, they're bound to show up. They happen because every single one of us categorize. We all categorize. And every single one of us, you know, if, 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 you, if this isn't you, you can just praise God that you don't fall into this category but every single one of us has biases we've got certain preferences that well up within us every single one of us to some extent we discriminate against people who are not like us yet the big question for us as a church brave church is this this is the big question is to what extent will we allow those biases impact who we love and how we love them they happen by default, I think we could probably chalk that one up to Adam and Eve and thank them that because of that, we've got a sinful orientation. And we very naturally set ourselves above and apart from people who are not like us. But the question is, what are we going to do about that? To what extent are we going to allow that to determine who we love and how we love one another? Let me go ahead and answer that question for you. Because God already answered that question for us through Paul in Galatians chapter 3. Did you catch what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 3? He was talking about categories. Categories. He, 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 he says, he started talking about that there, there's no more Jew and, and Gentile. There's, there's no more Jew and Gentile. That's a, that's, a, that's a racial and ethnic category. Jew and Gentile. It's also a religious category too because you had, you had Christians who were Jewish and, and although they grew up Jewish believing in one way, now they've given their lives to Jesus. They're following Jesus, but they're still very much Jewish. Then you had Gentiles. And many of them grew up with either no religious background or understanding of who God might be, or they had a very, very incorrect way of viewing God. You categories. That, one, that one's both religious. That one's, that one's ethnic. That's racial category. Then you have the category of, of male and female. No more male and female. That obviously the category of gender. Then he says, there's no more slave or free. That's a socioeconomic category. That's your socioeconomic status. And I need to pause for a second and, and, and hit this. Matt hit it very well um, before the song, um, No Longer Slaves. But I got to touch on this too, because that term slave is one that it can be very, very confusing reading in the New Testament throughout the entire Bible. And unfortunately, it's been very, very misused and misinterpreted. When Paul is talking about the term as a slave, it was a, a much more complex term than we've got for us today. Because during his time, on one hand, the term could be used in one of two ways. On one hand, it, it could have been used to describe someone who had, had lost their finances, gone into financial hardship, and they were completely broke, and they would have otherwise died. But what you could do in their day and age is you could commit yourself, sell yourself to working for someone so that you could work yourself out of that place of debt and eventually become free. Another term for this would have been bond servant that probably would work 
better for us. But then there were other people during Paul's age that were slaves in the context that you and I, 21st century Americans, are more familiar with. And this was always, let me say this again, was always an unjust, incorrect, and wrong way of life. Always. If you ever get into a conversation about the Bible condoning slavery, eh, wrong. Even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, when the bondservant slavery existed, Moses made it very clear, in no way are we ever to kidnap or force anyone to work from. It's always unjust. It's always wrong. I hate that I have to still talk about that nowadays, but I still have to bring things like that up. Okay, time back in. When Paul is mentioning these categories, the category between Jews and Gentiles, the category of slave and free, the category of male and female, he's pointing out the three main categories of his time that most prevalently divided the church. These were the the three main categories that set people above and apart from each other. And Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, says this, no more. Not in the church. Not in the body of Christ. Those categories, nope. You're not living that way anymore. The world might, the world might use those categories to define who you are, and how you should be treated, but not in the body of Christ. This was wild talk that Paul was speaking. Wild talk for it. Y'all think that we categorize here as Americans? They lived and died based on their categories. I was reading uh, in one commentary this last week how a very common prayer for Jewish men during this time. Paul is writing to some Jewish Christians, and a very common prayer for Jewish Christians was that they would wake up and they would think, thank God that they were Jewish and not Gentile. They would thank God that they were a male and not a female. They would thank God that they were free and not a slave. Can you imagine their faces when Paul shows up speaking under the divine influence of the Holy Spirit and says, nope, nope, but rather in Christ, by faith, you've got a new category. You've got one category that is to determine how you treat each other. Here's my big idea here uh, today, Brave Church. This is the big idea. Categories kill our connection unless we make Christ our main category. Categories, by default, will kill our connection and our diverse unity unless we very intentionally make Christ our main category. Let's go further. I told you I would. The category that we've got for people's skin color. We've seen this, and it's happened for most of us. Very naturally creates divisions by default. We got our in-group and our out-group, and it kills connection. Very naturally, it kills connection. But Paul's saying, no, 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 not when you make Christ the main category. By default, the category will, this category of, of skin color will create biases, will create points of, of discrimination. But we got to make Christ our number one category. Let me say it this way. When we choose to live our lives on cruise control, and when we just allow our mind to work the way that it instinctively works, we, we will be subject to categories that set us above and apart from one another. And we cannot experience the love that Jesus talked about. And that's why we're not meant to spend our lives on cruise control, y'all. We are meant to live our lives under the control and the leadership of Jesus Christ. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. And so today, as we're getting ready to close and the band can start making their way up, I want to get super practical. Super practical. Somebody say super practical. Super practical. Uncomfortably practical. And some things that we need to do if we're to make Christ our number one category. If we're to change the way that we think about one another. Change the way that we treat each other. Here's here's the first thing that I believe that, that we've got to do. If Christ, if Christ is our number one category, the first one is this, is that we need to examine the content in our categories. You need to spend some time this week Look at what's in that category. And again, I'm talking, I'm just talking specifically about the category, the color of someone's skin. What's in that category for them? Spend some time thinking about it. When you see someone of another skin color that's not like yours, what do you think? What are the things that come to your mind? Well, I just see Jesus. 
If that's you, please write a book, because all the rest of us need help. By default, what do you think? What do you very naturally think? What's in your category? And here's a great question to ask yourself. Why is what's in your category in your category? All my white brothers and sisters in the room, why do you think this? Why is this something that comes to your mind about our brothers and sisters who have a different color of skin than you do? Why is it in there? How did it get in there? Again, I'm the pastor of this church and I chose this series. And so I got to lead by, by transparency and, and I'll do that. And um, by saying this, and I say this with confidence because I got a lot of people in color here that I love very much and they love me. But there are things that I used to think were true of all black people. I just thought it was true of all black people. But then upon further examination, all of a sudden I realized that it was faulty information. And that what I had put in, in the category was based on very minimal information and a handful of experiences. There's a fancy scientific term for this. Man, I'm sounding super smart today. Come back next week and I'll be who I usually am. Um, fancy scientific term for this. It's called the outgroup homogeneity effect outgroup homogeneity effect and it's where when you're in your in-group you think we just instinctively we think we're all different but then when it comes to our out-group they're all the same it just it happens very naturally by default we're all so this this happens let me uh give you an illustration christians i, I bet we've all been here before i know that i have <laughs> where someone said to me oh you're a christian like them and I had to be like, I am a Christian, but I not like that Christian. Nah, not like that. Because we're different. Same category, a lot of different types of Christians. And I would not like to be subject and defined in my identity as a Christ follower by the experience that someone had with someone else. And yet far too often, church, we're okay. We're okay with just assuming that people of a different race are all the same. And well, I guess that's a black thing. I guess that's a white thing. Guess that's a brown thing. Guess that's an Asian thing. Guess that's a Hispanic thing. We're okay with that, aren't we? If we're being real with ourselves and if we open up the Holy Spirit and allow him, poke at me, Lord. We're had to allow God to poke at me, God. Point out those things. Point out the wrongful thinking because it's misinformed it's flawed but but we got we we so badly want to have a conclusion we so badly want to figure out because that's what our brains do in, in the 1980s two psychologists they they coined a phrase about our brains and they called the brain a cognitive miser cognitive miser cognitive meaning mental processes i had to look up what it meant um and miser meaning someone that hoards and holds on to something and what they were saying is that our brains our, our brains love holding on to energy our brains hate working our brains hate thinking so much in fact that our brains and our minds will prioritize creating a category in the quickest way possible rather than creating the most accurate category and it's just easier to I got them figured out I know who they are I know how they all are. Here's why it's so destructive. Number one, it's really just bad and prideful and wrong. There's a lot of things I could say about it. But this is the big thing for us as the church is that when you got a whole race, a whole nother type of people figured out and you know, it kills curiosity. And when you've got no curiosity, you've got no reason to connect. And it kills the diverse unity that we're aiming for in this series. Check what's inside your category. Here's the second thing. Check what's in your category. And when you do that, what it's probably going to illuminate is that you need someone to come in to that de category and define it for you. And so that's why we got to not only examine what's in our category, but we have to invite Christ into our categories. We got to invite Jesus in. Because left to our own devices, left to our default mode, our categories are flawed. They're incomplete. 
they're narrow. And that's why we as Christ followers are meant to be different. We're called to be different. We're called to invite Christ into those categories. At best, our categories, they're generalizations. And at their worst, they are very damaging and divisive stereotypes that Jesus hates. Just going to call it what it is. That he died to break down. But when we invite Christ into the category, he compels us to see each other as individuals. And rather than going into a conversation and assuming you know exactly what they think, because I know how they think. No, no, no. Christ says, no, 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 no. There, there's a specific imprint of the image of God. We are all, this is what makes diverse unity so amazing because we are all very unique reflections of who God is. We ain't the same. He didn't create us the same. But when we, when we allow Christ to come into our categories, he compels us to get curious about what, what another story is. He compels us to, to get curious and ask more questions. He, he compels us to get curious about each other's perspective. He compels us to connect. He compels us. Instead of setting ourselves apart and dividing, that's, what, that's, that's why it's so appalling. It's so distancing to talk about us and them. If there was a hand movement for when we talk about that, it's this. It's the Heisman. Let that be your indication, church. Let that be my indication. That every time we get in a conversation like that, that's, that's what we're doing. Because we feel comfortable with people who are like us. We feel so comfortable, in fact, that we're able to talk about them. That creates distance. When we invite Christ into our categories, here's the third thing that we got to do. And I'm stealing this one from Miles McPherson. It's too good not to share. We give our out group the same love we give to our in-group. We give our out-group the same love we give to our in-group. And you want to know why that's going to be very difficult? Because it's not natural. It's not a natural type of love. Get this. It's a supernatural type of love. It's the type of love that supersedes what comes natural to you. It's not natural for us. We just talked. I, I did a, the first 10 minutes about how natural our brains categorize. It's not natural. But it's what we're called to do. Jesus made a comment about this in Matthew chapter 6. And he said this. He's like, what good is it that you love people that love you? What good is that? Of course you're going to love them. What good is it that the world does that? Culture does that. Culture preaches that. What good is it that you just love people that are like you? What good is it that you just love people who agree with you? What good is it that you just love the people that you feel comfortable around? What good is it that you feel that you just love people that you're more patient with, that you're willing to give the benefit of the doubt? Did it ever, did it ever, did we ever stop to consider that we were Jesus? We were his outgroup. We were Jesus. We were his outgroup. This is the type of love that changes the world because it already changed the world. Because when we were his outgroup, he did something about it. And he didn't distance himself from us. He loved us so much that what he, did he what was he willing to do? He was willing to step into his outgroup. Because it says that it was when we were still sinners, when we were still lost, when we were still imperfect when we were still dead to all of our mistakes and our failures, it was at that moment that Jesus stepped into our skin and he showed how much he loved us by way of the cross. Man, that's convicting to me, y'all. I don't know if it's convicting to you. Holy Spirit's poking all around because that's not something that comes naturally to me, God. Y'all think I'm preaching from a place of perfection? Uh-uh, I'm preaching, I'm preaching from a place of wanting some progress. I ain't ever going to be your perfect pastor. I'm preaching from a place that I don't want to stay the way I've been and who I was, but I want to move forward and become more like Jesus. Anyone else with me? That just doesn't come natural. It was, it was the thing that, that made Jesus repulsive to people. It was the thing that made people despise him. Stand with me. We're closing. It was a thing that made people scoff at him. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and, and he, 
he had Jesus over to dinner and as they were leaving to go to his house you want to know what everyone said as Jesus turned well he's gone to be the guest of a sinner because they thought certainly no 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 Jesus if he's God he ain't gonna step step man and, and that out group Zacchaeus was he had some issues and yet Jesus he had no problem with it here's the challenge for us church this is my official challenge Jesus was willing to man he was willing to shatter people's perspectives what they thought of him by associating himself and loving and connecting with people who didn't believe in him who I mean we talking we could expand this to talking about people that don't believe what we believe we got a hard enough time doing that in the church and yet Jesus had no problem breaking bread with them the challenge for us is if we are not willing and intentional about breaking bread and connecting with people because of their skin color I'll tell you right now we're not scratching the surface on the love that Jesus died for us to experience what is it that you just love people that love you what is it that you just love people that like you our world is watching us and they've been watching us as a church. I, I, I don't even know. I can't even say since when, because I don't, long, long time ago. Talk about the American church, that our world is watching us as American church, and they're watching us love people who are like us, and they're going like this. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But when we break from our default mode and start loving on design, when we start loving on purpose and we start going out of our way well I don't have any friends that are of a different skin color yeah that's right you got to go out of your way that's what Jesus did kind of went out of his way to meet us here when we start doing that when the world starts seeing us love people who aren't like us that'll turn some heads that's the type of church that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 17 that's the type of unity the type of diverse unity that the world will see and Jesus said by that diverse unity, they will know that I am the light of the world, that I am the Savior to all mankind. That's the diverse unity that we're called to experience. Here's my question. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to spend just a few minutes in worship. And this is, you don't even have to say a word during worship. Let Matt, let these beautiful vocalists, let them do their, do their job. But here's the questions that I, I want you to wrestle with today, even just for a few minutes. What's in your category? What would happen if you invited the Holy Spirit in your category and said, God, would you start to point out things that I've been thinking about another person, I've been believing about another person, would you point them out to me? And when you come into my category and define how I see each other, because those, those things that we think about the other person, they divide us. They give us all the reasons not to connect because you already know how they are what's in your category and what would your life look like what would our relationships look like if Christ was our main category Father we thank you so much for today God I pray that as we worship you here God and as we just continue to welcome not your presence you're here but we want to welcome your influence we want to welcome your voice into this God that you would begin to speak to us Father that this isn't just a place where we want to feel good this is not a place, and I certainly don't wake up where it's like, oh, that was a pretty good message. Uh, -huh. we want life change. And that only happens with you. That only happens when we surrender ourselves and open our hearts up and say, Jesus, would you come in and define the way that I see you? God, we want that. Speak to us in this moment. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Brave Church Podcast. We hope that you feel challenged and inspired to move forward in the life that you're meant to live. If you don't have a church you call home, we'd like to personally invite you to join us for one of our weekend experiences here in Milwaukee. If you'd like to support Brave Church financially, you can head over to bravechurch.tv slash give. That's bravechurch.tv slash give. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.